So there was once this D&D player named Jack who had earned the nickname Dice Hog. I don't know why. They all had their own dice, but that's just what they called him. And anyway, Jack was a tall, lanky fellow with a mischievous glint in his eyes and a penchant for bending the rules to his advantage. At first, Jack's antics were harmless enough, mostly. He would occasionally fudge his dice rolls, claiming improbable successes with a sheepish grin and a wink. Now, his friends would all chuckle indulgently, chalking it up to Jack's exuberant personality. However, as the campaign progressed, Jake's behavior grew increasingly disruptive. He began steamrolling over his fellow players, interrupting the role-playing moments with grandiose declarations of his own character's powerus. Prowess? Prowess. He would puppet master his companions, dictating their actions in combat and belittling their choices if they dared to deviate from his plans. Come on, we've all had that guy in our games, right? Now, his friends tried to reason with him, gently reminding him of the importance of cooperation and fair play. I mean, this was a cooperative tabletop RPG, right? But Jack would have none of it. He argued incessantly, insisting that his way was the only way to play the game. He even resorted to blatant cheating, building a wall of books and energy cans around his dice rolling area, or conveniently forgetting to deduct hit points from his character sheet, or misremembering how an ability worked. To his advantage, I might add. Despite the group's best efforts, Jack's Toxic behavior continued to poison the atmosphere of their gaming sessions. Is it Jack or Jake? I think I'm getting confused. Either it's Jack or it's Jake. I've been saying one name or the other. We're just gonna keep with Jack at this point, I think. I mean, we're changing his name anyway to protect the innocent or to protect the not so innocent. So I guess it doesn't really matter. Anyway, the once joyous gatherings became tense and fraught with frustration. Players began making excuses to skip sessions, preferring to not play at all than to have to endure another game with Jack. Eventually, the group reached a breaking point. Fed up with Jack's antics, they confronted him as a unified front, explaining how his behavior had soured their enjoyment of the game. But Jack remained defiant, stubbornly refusing to acknowledge the harm he had caused. So, with heavy hearts, they tied Jack to the gaming table and began their ritualistic chant to tire. The deity of justice, curved daggers held high. Though it was a painful choice, they knew that preserving the integrity of their gaming experience was paramount and that some sacrifices would need to be made. Thus, the group made the difficult decision that day to part ways with Jack bidding farewell to their once beloved friend. And so the Dice Hog was banished from their midst. And let me tell you, their very next game session was the best one they had ever. Look, if you're a game master, you're going to run into horrible D&D players. And if you're a player, well, you might possibly even be one of them. So today we're going to go over the seven different types of toxic, no good, very bad players. You might have the great honor of having in your tabletop role-playing game someday, or the great honor of telling them goodbye. And I am not advocating any sort of use of that game prop. It's purely a video technique. Cause you know somebody's gonna think I'm serious, right? By the way, our next Kickstarter, Layers and Legends 2, is now live. During the first few days, we will have a couple of early backer specials going on where you can save tons on these beautiful limited edition alt covers. I mean, holy crap, look at these bad boys. Also, if you back on day one, that's today, April 2nd, you're gonna get a first day backer special credit in each book. That's your name in each of these books a digital 5e adventure bundle, and the wallpaper art and art pack for free as our way of thanking you for backing on day one, which is today, right now. Just in case there was any chance you got it. Now, if you're a dungeon master looking to run fifth edition games your players will love, you need this definitive fifth edition resource anthology. We're gonna be giving backers two massive books, Layers and Legends 2 and Loot and Lore 2 
filled with professionally developed 5e adventures, encounters, monsters, magic items, brain-burning puzzles, custom rule sets, and more. My team and I took everything you loved from the 2022 issues of Layer Magazine, enhanced and improved for even more exciting gameplay. We carefully crafted everything in these books to be both exciting to run and easy to use. What's more, these two books will give you content you can use in your games for years to come. These books will be big, beefy boys, over 300 pages each and probably pushing the 400 page mark. When we make books, we make books. So click that link below to learn more and back Layers of Legends 2 before the special early backer deals run out. Okay, now on to the seven types of toxic D&D players. Number one, the protagonist. This is the self-centered dude who sees themselves as the only player at the table. Those other seats, well, they might as well be empty. The game exists for them and and them only. Other players be darned. While they may acknowledge that warm bodies sit around the table with them, they certainly view themselves as the most important one. There are different types of protagonists, but they generally exhibit one or more of the following wonderful behaviors, guaranteed to ruffle feathers around every table. First, steamrolling. They talk over other players and want to be everywhere and do everything. They jump on other players' ideas and take over the scene. They push to the front of the line when players are taking turns telling the GM what they'd like to do. These players are often referred to as the interrupters or the blurters. Next, puppet mastering. These players assume that every last idea that floats through their self-absorbed brains is the best idea to ever be born. And they take great pleasure in telling other players what they should do. This most frequently happens in combat and it's usually linked to their trying to set up some elaborate plan for their own combat turn where they will be super awesome and carry the day yet again. I mean, at least in their own minds. Why players do this? Well, who knows? Maybe they actually believe they know how to do things best, or maybe they are just control freaks. However, puppet mastering is an abysmal practice and amounts to stealing agency just as much as when the game master might do it. The final protagonist subtype is the lone wolf edgelord. This is the player who always seems to want to go off on their own and solo dungeons. Or they just want to do their own thing, apart from the other player's characters. Why? Because they are that awesome, I suppose. Or, or they're just looking to be the center of attention on their own solo missions. Like the world revolves around them. Whee! Regardless, they subvert the group dynamic that most tabletop RPGs have and other players and GMs game experience is not even a consideration for them. Now, protagonists are often genuinely excited to be playing the game, and that is always a welcome addition to any table, but they cross the line of pushing the other players out of the spotlight in exchange for their own good time. They're at best spotlight hogs and at worst bullies. Now the classic game master solution to Almost any problem you're gonna encounter in this game applies to these players, of course. Talk to them about their unacceptable behavior and ask them to change. You could also use timers, force the taking of turns, and simply ignore their interruptions and focus on the other players. However, I will mention that I personally will never use timers or force turn taking as a solution to players like this. I use turn taking, of course, in combat, and I have used timers for other uses, but not to overcome this particular type of problem player. The bottom line is that I will not punish the other players for one player's bad behavior, but that's just me. I believe in solving the root problem, not punishing the rest of the world because one person can't behave. Number two, the aggressor. This is the player who wants things their way and God protect anyone who disagrees. Now, there are different kinds of aggressors, but they generally exhibit one or more of the following behaviors. First, arguing. These players argue about everything. And if there's nothing to argue about, well, they'll just make something up. Believe me, their creativity in this department knows no bounds. They argue with the other players over the plan of action and sulk when they're outvoted. They argue with the GM over whether or not the character's current circumstances should get them a bonus of some kind. Or if you're really lucky, they might even be the extremely toxic rules lawyers who need to argue every single game master ruling that isn't in line with their interpretation of the rules. Classic, classic example of this. I once had a player who had been playing with us for perhaps 
an entire year, if not longer. And then out of the blue, he tried to argue the definition of a five foot reach. He was trying to say that you measure the five feet from the edge of one square to the edge of the other square. In other words, his PC didn't need to be next to the monster on the grid, but instead he could tack him if there was a space in between them. I mean, holy crap, not only is that just flat out wrong, you measure from center of square to center of square like every elementary player and game master probably understands that, but we had been playing that way, the way of, you know, having to be adjacent to each other with a five foot reach to be able to attack them for like over a year. And then suddenly, because it was to his own advantage to change the rules, he tries to make this argument. And it was absolutely nuts. I, I think I was just breathtaking and mind blown. Like, how do you even argue against this? It's, it's like arguing against insanity. You have to be insane to engage in that argument. I don't think that analogy made sense, but I think you understand what I mean. Now, my friend Ed, who also helps me with my video scripts. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> so like when I talk about firing my script writer, uh, that's Ed, I guess, except that I would never fire him because he's awesome and he does amazing work. So your job is safe, Ed. Anyway, Ed once had a player argue about the number of hit points goblins should have. You see, the player had just dealt eight points of damage to a goblin, but the goblin didn't die. So he was arguing that goblins only have seven hit points per the monster manual. You can see the stat block right here. It's obvious. Of course, Ed was rolling 2d6 the goblins hit dice for their hit points and not just taking the average. So the dude's goblin actually had 10 hit points. However, because it was in his character's best interest that Ed use average hit points, a half hour argument was needed to resolve the matter. By the way, the player didn't win. Good job, Ed. He's like, no, screw that. It has 10 hit points. Sit down, shut up. <laughs> I'm sure he was nicer than that. Ed's a nice guy. So I'm, <laughs> that's just like in my brain. I'm just like, you put him in his place. Yeah, what up? I was advocate for being nice to people. So this is me. Okay, we're gonna keep moving. Next, aggressors are sometimes hardcore competitors. They see the game as a competition, either between them and the GM or them and the other players. They want to win, even if it means arguing, cheating, or demeaning people in order to win in that moment. Of course, they aren't really winning and they're turning themselves and everyone else into losers with regard to their overall game experience. Aggressors also like to criticize. They don't necessarily tell the other players what to do, but they certainly tell them how wrong they were when something doesn't work out. Or they criticize the GM's rulings, decisions, or game in general without offering any constructive feedback. Constructive feedback is when a complaint is rendered along with a suggestion for how to improve that thing. But complaining in general for the sake of complaining with no offer to provide a solution is usually just not super helpful. No, no, no. These players just defecate their complaints about anything they can find. That's what they do. Aggressors might also be the PVPer at the table. These are often people who come to TTRPGs from video games for what it's worth. These are the players who will attack other players' characters, steal from other characters, or willfully leave other characters to die because they didn't agree with the player's choice or just because they're jerks who want to see the other characters suffer. And the other players suffer by way of, you know, uh, whatever you call it. Anyway, I personally abhor PvP in almost any sense at my games. It has a pernicious, tendency to upset players and disrupt group harmony and frankly fun. There are very few groups of mature players that can handle in-game PVP without getting upset out of the game. The Rage Monster. Holy crap. These are perhaps the worst subtype of the aggressor. This is the player who goes irate over any little issue or slight or bad die roll and throws a full blown temper tantrum that would put any five-year-old child to shame. They put off or intimidate the other players, usually just utterly ruining the game session. Now the less scary but equally toxic version of this subtype is the seether, who expresses their rage through passive aggressive behavior instead of violent outbursts. And then you have the classic and time-honored murder hobo. Aggressors often fall into this category, but remember that a combat focused game isn't a bad thing. Sometimes the entire group just wants to fight things. True murder hoboing expresses itself in two ways. First, by just killing anything that moves and breathes. Innocent shopkeepers, cute little kitty cats, 
Almost nothing is off limits for this sort of player. But murder hobos also step on other players' fun because when they get bored of a non-combat scene, they might simply attack something nearby. This destroys whatever the other players were attempting to do by forcing a combat on the entire group. Unless, of course, the other players say, screw this guy and let him get himself killed by himself. I mean, that would like be poetic justice, I guess, right? Now, a lot of times, aggressors may not even recognize what they're doing, or at the very least, they don't consider their behavior to be wrong. I mean, few people in the world honestly admit to their wrong behavior. Most of us are just quick to excuse and justify, aren't we? Anyway, aggressors may be type A personalities or self-proclaimed alphas but they need to understand that they're not the top dog at the table. Cooperative group games have no place for this sort of behavior. The only real solution here is to talk to them about their unacceptable behavior. If they refuse to change or refuse to even try to change, well, there's nothing that can really be done except showing them the door. Or, you know, time to the altar, I guess, right? To continue that metaphor, which is completely not a recommended course of action. Again, I think I'm gonna get myself in trouble in this video. I, I really think I am. <laughs> Number three, the burden. This type of player exhibits a behavior that brings down the game, the mood, or the entire table, often grinding things to a complete halt. There are different kinds of burden players, but they generally present one or more of the following behaviors. Willful ignorance. Burdens refuse to learn even the most basic rules of the game, even if they played the game for years. They never know which modifiers to apply or what their character's abilities are or how an even basic function of the rules works, such as advantage, disadvantage in fifth edition D&D. I mean, I don't know, but it seems like they just decide not to bother learning the rules, which results in their pawning the responsibility of knowing the rules to everyone else at the table, then has to help them every single time they want to do anything in the game. Again, remember, burden. Not to be confused with a new player who's still learning. That's a completely different thing, right? Constantly distracted. Burdens may be at the game, but they're not actually paying attention because they're doing something else like surfing the internet on their phones or stacking their dice or planning for their next level up. And worse, they often try to drag other players into their distraction. They might pass around videos or show off their tower of dice or groan when it falls and clatters to the table or they start a side conversation that distracts everyone at the table. By the way, as a game master, I hate side conversation. When one starts, I often just stop what I'm doing and stare at the offending player with my very best look of death. Honed to perfection, I might add, over four years of being a high school teacher. <laughs> yeah, what can you do to them but just stare at them? Oh, you're gonna get it, boy. I mean, the look of death works, baby, it works. At least it did when I was a high school teacher. I probably get in trouble now. All right, but let's just move on from that topic, shall we? That's gonna get us in some comment trouble. Now, sometimes the problem of constantly distracted is that the game isn't really that good, so they're looking for something else to do to occupy their minds. However, sometimes players like this think they can multitask, but they instead miss stuff and distract other players. Now, full disclosure, when I'm a player in online games, online games, I want to emphasize, I'm usually doing some activity that requires very little brain power while I'm playing, such as cleaning my firearms or painting minis. This actually helps me focus on what's happening in the game. I've seen others knit at their D&D games, and while I'm no knitter, I, I've tried and I, I think I stabbed myself. I'm guessing that there's something that helps them focus too, like that activity of knitting. But I'm 100% paying attention, Zach, I promise I am. Zach runs our Pathfinder 2 online game. We're running through Abomination Vaults right now, and I'm always doing something else while we're playing the game. Usually it's cleaning a firearm, sometimes putting minis together. I once super glued my fingers together during our game online because I was gluing together minis, and I literally, it was like, it was like an hour of me trying to unsuper glue my fingers. It was, it was miserable. Oh, the fun stories. <laughs> of course, that was a distraction to everybody, so I probably uh, broke the rules there myself, huh? Unprepared. These burdens don't bring dice or pencils or even their character sheet. Yes, I have had players show up at my games without their character sheets. It's like, yo, what are you doing here, dude? You got like nothing to play. <laughs> 
Sometimes you genuinely forget and they like email me the PDF and I go print it off for them. It's not that big of a deal, it happens, you know, but some people are just like woefully unprepared. But unprepared players are always missing something. Perhaps they've forgotten what happened in the previous session because they didn't take notes or don't pay attention to recaps. They're late or miss a game entirely because they didn't give themselves enough time to get there or they just forgot the game was happening. It's on my calendar. My, my games are on my calendar, baby, because I want to play that game. I don't know about you. But they're also never ready on their turn because they don't know what their character can do or what their spells can do which brings me to the time waster. These players drag out everything and waste precious game time. They are never satisfied with the plan until they've analyzed every possible angle. They're never ready on their turn and don't actually start thinking about what their character should do until the GM calls their name. You've all been in play tables with these players and it's... <laughs> all right, I'm gonna calm down, I swear. Furthermore, they're always ready to blame someone else when their unpreparedness is pointed out. Look! Jim's fireball changed my plan, and now I have to rethink which spell I'm going to cast. Or, Todd didn't hear me point out the flaw in plan A, so now I need to improvise. Or, the GM moved the monster that was standing right there, and then ruined what I was going to do. Trust me, it's always something. Now, these players are often casual players who are there more for the social experience than the actual game. However, they may also just be lazy or disinterested. Sometimes these behaviors are the result of a bad game, but in many cases, they are the result of a player's personality or lack of interest. So what's the solution? Well, you gotta talk to them about their unacceptable behavior. Like, do you notice a trend here? Now you could also set clear table rules, use timers, keep extra resources on hand, character sheets, pencils, dice, etc., and buy a military grade Wi Fi jammer. Those right there can be exceptionally useful, believe me. Okay. Now the next three toxic player types are ones that could exasperate any of the above player types or could just be problems on their own. Oh, and if you're finding this information useful, please give me a thumbs up and share this video with your fellow Game Master and your fellow players. And if you're a Game Master and you share it with your players, or if you're a player and your Game Master shared the video with you, well, I'd be asking your Game Master, why? Which number am I? And if you're not already subscribed to my channel and you think that I don't completely suck, why not subscribe while you're at it? I mean, don't you know that every YouTuber's sense of self-worth is tied to their subscriber count? I mean, you don't want me off crying in a corner, do you now? Or maybe you do. <laughs> Jerk. Number four, the comedian. These players feel the deep-rooted need to inject comedy into every single moment of the game, especially at the least appropriate times. Often their comedy is crass or offensive, but it almost always breaks the mood. Look, humor is fun and the game should be fun, but there are times when it is 100% disruptive. When the GM spends time heightening the tension in a horror game, for example, and the players are really enjoying and getting into it, that is not the time for the comedian to kill the mood with hilarious sexual innuendos. Comedians may not always kill the fun, but they definitely kill the moment. And they really upset the players who want to get into the moment. Number five, the pundit. These are the players who just have to bring real world politics into everyone else's fantasy game. Now this isn't always a problem, but that's usually only the case that the entire table has agreed to be political and then everyone shares the same beliefs. You know, in our world these days, you can't actually have different beliefs and not want to kill each other for some reason. Come on, we all know that discussing politics is probably the number one way to get everyone riled up and heatedly arguing. Politics is best left away from the game table. Most people come to tabletop RPGs to escape the pressures and realities of the real world for just a few hours. So that crap is usually unwelcome. Pundits and the resulting arguments they cause can be game killers and even group killers. Number six, the cheater. You know, the interesting thing about this is that videos and articles galore exist on this topic and this player type. We deep dive into all the different ways players cheat, how to stop them, why it's bad, and ruins everyone's game experience. But the simple fact is that players like this continue to exist despite our best efforts to purge the universe of their existence. The bottom line is that cheaters want to win. They need to win, even if they have to cheat to do so. 
and this ends up damaging the GM's and the other players' fun. Why? Well, because cheaters are rarely as clever as they think they are. They either get caught or everyone else sees exactly what they're doing. My classic example is that I once had a player who would create a fortress around his area, books piled up, energy cans, etc. And so no one could see his dice. And then, surprise, surprise, this dude constantly rolled high. It was amazing. Like, no one could believe their luck. Not surprisingly, cheaters usually cause bad blood between them and the other players because everyone usually sees them cheating their way to success when the other players are playing the game straight. Now, I have an entire video on the different ways tabletop RPG players often cheat and what you can do about it. It's called Sneaky Ways D&D Players Cheat. Oops. So sneaky. And I will throw a link down below it for it, it to it you if you want to you, you know w w w watch. I don't know. Talking is hard. What can I say? I had a slight brain meltdown right there. What are you gonna do? However, in general, and much like the other types of toxic players, the solution is to talk to them about their crappy behavior. Usually it's a bad idea to just let it ride and mitigate it behind the scene because other players may just think that you're accepting their behavior and that could exasperate the situation. Number seven, the terrorist. Now, these types of toxic behaviors are quite possibly the absolute worst. So we saved them for last. If you made it this far in the video, you're getting this special sauce. Oh, speaking of sauce, there's this pizza joint in Kalamazoo, Michigan, Bilbo's Pizza, that I love. And they have this dill sauce that is really good. I could dip breadsticks in that sauce all day long. Their wings and pizza are top notch as well. And if you're in the area, make sure you stop by Sweetwater's Donut Mill. Those are the best donuts you will ever have. Okay, sorry, another tangent, but, but they're so good, you have to go there. Anyway, the terrorist. These players are just jerks. They deliberately sabotage the game for their own jollies and at the cost of everyone else at the table. Terrorists generally fall into two categories. One, the blackmailer. This type of terrorist is an emotional blackmailer and hostage taker. They try to get what they want through intimidation tactics. For example, this is the player who will say, if you don't heal me, you'll be sorry next time you need my help or if you kill my character, Mr. Game Master, sir, I'm quitting the game, walking away, and I will tell everyone on social media how horrible you are. Yeah, because your 300 followers on Twitter actually care. Or the blackmailer takes something that belongs to someone else and jokingly threatens to not give it back unless the player does what they want them to do. Next, we have the role play terrorists. These players could have any of the toxic behaviors previously mentioned, but they do it deliberately with full knowledge of how horrible their behavior and actions are. And then if questioned about their actions, they use the time honored excuse of, that's what my character would do, or I'm just playing in character to justify their behavior. And make no mistake, role play terrorists are not actually role player type players who are making decisions based on their character's personality and backstory. No. They are weaponizing role-playing and using it to hurt the other characters, their players, or the game in general because it gets them off one way or another. Now, you can try talking to players like this with the hope that they might change, but good luck. In my opinion, there may be only one solution for dealing with terrorists. Throw them out and tell them never to come back. Every other type of toxic player we've discussed can be talked to or mitigated somehow. But terrorists are usually just irredeemable bullies and showing them the door is usually your best bet. Anyway, those are my seven types of toxic players. Did I miss any? What types of toxic players have you had in your games and how did you resolve things? And don't forget to check out our Layers and Legends 2 Kickstarter at the link below. This is your chance to get your hands on the biggest and baddest fifth edition GM resources you've ever laid your eyes on. If you'd like to learn about the eight warning signs that it's time to kick that guy from your group, watch this video right here. And until next time, happy game mastering.